Good afternoon. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I know it's been a long day, so I appreciate you guys hanging out and, uh, and I hope we can uh, have a good time together. So let's start with this, just to give me context to know where I want to take this talk. How many people in this room have no idea who I am or my spiel? Raise your hand. Well, that fucking hurts. <laughs> Jesus, that's a bad way to start a talk. I kind of figured, actually, so what I'll do is give you a little bit of context of where I come from so the things that I'm gonna talk about might make a lot of sense. Uh, I was born in, uh, in Belarus in the former Soviet Union and my family immigrated to the United States in 1978 when I was three years old. We, uh, we lived in a small studio apartment in Queens, New York with nine family members one eighth of the size of this stage and it was really quite difficult and it was hardcore, right? It was super immigrant, you know, you know, it was my, my sister's baby seat was a car seat found in the garbage. It was kind of raw. Uh, my dad got a job uh, as a stock boy in, in New Jersey and was commuting from Queens to Jersey and eventually worked really hard and became the assistant manager, then manager of that store and eventually we moved to Edison, New Jersey. Edison, New Jersey is where I started my entrepreneurial career. Um, In Edison, I basically put all my friends to work. So when I was six, I had eight lemonade stands in Edison, New Jersey, a franchise. You guys remember big wheels, that little like thing, big wheels? I used to ride my big wheels in Edison, New Jersey and pick up my cash like I was Tony Soprano. (laughs) It was pretty interesting. By the way, on that note, it's amazing what you learn at such a young age if you're entrepreneurial. There was a kid that used to come just for the summers. I didn't know what divorce was or things of that nature back then so I never understood it. His name was Eric Conrad. He used to come just for the summers. And he was the only friend of mine that actually made signs and tried to sell stuff as well. So he always sold much more lemonade than all my other friends. However, I would always count how many cups I gave everybody and he was actually stealing. He was actually taking a dollar or two each day. But because his revenue was so much higher, I would let him go. So it was pretty fascinating. (laughs) You can learn a lot. When I was 11, I started my baseball card business. So I was doing baseball card shows in the malls of New Jersey uh, and did quite well. I was making two to three thousand dollars a weekend selling baseball cards and that was phenomenal. And I don't know about you guys, but when you have thirty thousand dollars in cash under your bed and you're 13 and you're not selling weed, you're doing a good job. (laughs) So that was good. And everything was rocking. It was gonna be awesome. I was gonna be the biggest baseball card dealer of all time. Everything was great and then I turned 14 and my dad ruined my life. See, I was getting ready for one of the biggest shows in New Jersey and getting my cards together and my dad walks in, he goes, you're coming to the store. I go, dad, I think you're, you're misunderstanding. I have a show today. I'm not quite sure how many of you have a Soviet dad but I lost that argument. So I began to cry. I basically cried the whole 40 minutes that we commuted because we lived 40 minutes from the store down, the, down Route 78 in Jersey the whole way, crying the whole way. Finally, about two minutes before we get there, I compose myself and I go, Dad, how much are you gonna pay me? And he said, two bucks an hour. And then I really started crying. <laughs> and it was terrible for the next year and a half, every weekend of my life, every single Thanksgiving vacation, every single day of summer vacation, every weekend, I was in my dad's basement of the liquor store bagging ice for 10 hours a day for two bucks an hour. How many people in this room have seen the movie The Goonies? Raise your hand. I was sloth. Remember that guy? Chained to the basement? That was me. I hated it and it was terrible. Then I turned 16 and was allowed upstairs. And my life changed. I was on the floor one day and every person came in asking for Camus Special Select 1990, it was Wine Spectator's Wine of the Year. Everybody. And I was seeing all these customers come in, ask for the wine, and then leave. And I was like, this sucks. Any good punk kid entrepreneur is not gonna let that happen. So the next person that comes in, I'm gonna take a back order. Now we didn't have a back order system, but I wasn't scared because I was going to school on Monday anyway. So, (laughs) 
So the next person comes in and he goes, you know, I will take some Camus. I'm like, great. I'm like, we're sold out, but I can take a back order. He gives me his name, his address. I go, how much would you like? He said, well, I'll take six cases. And I was like, ooh, an alcoholic. And he, I was like, are you having a party? And he goes, no, 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 I collect wine. And that was it. Literally, you know how you have these moments, you probably think about your own businesses when like something changed or you thought of it, you can like literally taste it. I can, I can literally, I the, I, can you zoom in? Like the goosebumps are here. Like I can literally feel where I was in my dad's old store in the Chardonnay section when that moment happened because I literally sat there. At this point, I wanted to help my family. I felt like I could bring something to the table. I was pretty ridiculous at 16, thinking like, you know, I knew what I could do. I felt confident. So I remember sitting there and saying, Silver Oak, Camus, Opus One, Chateau Lafitte, Frank Thomas, Ken Griffey Jr., Wayne Gretzky, same shit, I can do this. So literally, <laughs> literally, literally for the rest of my life, up until very recently, I put every ounce of my soul into becoming the greatest wine expert I could and building a huge wine business. I literally sat in science class in junior year, reading the wine spectator. I didn't give a fuck about Saturn, you know? <laughs> I was so all in, and that's what I focused on. Now, I did not grow up techie. The most teched out that I was at 18 years old was that there's nobody in this room that can beat me in NHL 94 for Sega Genesis. I literally didn't even have a computer until I was somewhere around 20 years old, okay? I was not teched out, I didn't grow up with it, but, what I'm obsessed with, what I'm about to talk to you about for the rest of this evening is culture shifts. What people actually do and how it affects it. I'm about to talk to you about social media, but I'm not a social media guy that's like, oh, let's all be kumbaya and rock climb and we're gonna drink tea and everybody's so happy. I don't care. Why I like social media, ready? Headline, ready? Here's why I like social media. Because it sells shit. So, I was hanging out with some nerd friends in college and they're like, check this out, there's this thing, the internet, and we could talk to chicks on this. And was, so that we heard the whole coo coo, that thing, right? And they went on and they're like, look, we're talking to chicks. And literally within the first 20 seconds, I'm like, I can sell stuff on this. And so I understood that this was going to be a platform that mattered. And in 1996, 1997, I started plotting that a change for my family business. My dad's store was called Shoppers Discount Liquors. I wanted to build the brand. So I launched winelibrary.com in 1997. In 1998, I took over daily operations and I grew that business from a three to a $60 million business in a seven year period. Now, I did that fairly traditionally. I did that through email and banner ads, which is traditional to me, by the way. You know, I did it through print and radio and it was great. I was very fortunate because I sat next to my lead developer in our office and he was very teched out. His name was Eric Kastner. If you're on Twitter, at Kastner, K-A-S-T-N-E-R. Hit him up, tell him I'm giving him some love. Anyway, he was showing me a different web. It was 04, it was 03, 04, 05 and I was like, what is this stuff? What's this Friendster? What's this MySpace? We were on YouTube extremely early. I'm like, this is changing. See, what I know is this. Marketing for the last 150 years has been push. Every person in this room a decade ago had to do all push marketing to sit in your seat. Whether it was radio or print, email services, banner ads, outdoor media, direct mail, TV, push. For the last 150 years, if you wanted to be good in business and marketing such a component of that, You basically had to be a quarterback. You threw the ball. And whoever told their story best in the right platform won. 100 years ago, people stood around a box, the radio. They're like, all right, they liked it. Then they watched TV, but it was always push. Even when the internet itself came, it was push. Banner ads and email services are push. We are living through the first time ever when it's pull. First time. In the first time in our history, customers actually have some semblance of voice and reaction and the culture shifts we're living through are substantial. Culture shifts. All of you have had a long day, you're about to go eat dinner and drink some wine and do some stuff and whatever. I really need you guys to do me a favor. Please don't bullshit me, lying is the devil. I need you to raise your hand high when I ask this question. 
I have no interest in your bullshit head nod or your half ass hand, I need your full hand. Can you promise me that? Okay. How many people here, three to five years ago probably, maybe more likely two, whether you said it in public or to yourself, said the following thing. I'm not getting a Facebook account. It's for kids, why would I ever need one? Don't fucking lie, raise your hands. It's a substantial number, thank you very much, put them down. How many of you right now have a Facebook account? Raise your hands. Guys, what just happened is the reason that I am gonna buy the New York Jets one day. My skill set and my belief is that I got lucky DNA wise to understand what people say they're not going to do but are gonna do. Three years ago at South by Southwest, Dennis Crowley showed me Foursquare. And he's like, check this out. And everybody's talking about it. It's one of the first hundred or so users hanging out, talking about it. Somebody asked me, Gary, are you gonna use Foursquare? I said, no, I don't use anything. I just use it for business. But I think people will use it. He goes, no, that's so stupid. Why would I check in to Foursquare when I can just tweet I'm somewhere? This is not gonna work. I said, Billy. I said, Billy, let me ask you a question. Tonight, when we go to a bar, if you check in and that bar then gives you a free shot of Jack Daniels, what are you gonna do? And he said, I'm gonna fucking check in. And I said, exactly. We like to draw lines in the sand. 90% of this audience just now, which, oh, by the way, and you might even wanna clap it up for yourselves, you guys are pretty badass. So clap yourselves up, it'll be fun. But, you guys are so fucking smart and 90% of you said I'm not gonna do this and now you did it. And that to me is fascinating. Let's go really raw. Who wants to go raw? How many people here 10 years ago said they would never get a cell phone because why would they want anybody to contact them anytime they want? Don't lie, it's gonna hurt, you're not gonna wanna raise your hand, but raise it. Thank you for the honest 40 of you. How many of you do not have a cell phone of those people? Raise your hand. Zero. This is happening every day and marketing is being shifted. Eyeballs are shifting. The way we build our businesses are shifting. Yet we continue to do things like it's 2007, six, four, two, one. I'm not mad at the way we market our businesses in traditional ways, I'm really not. But what we have to understand is that it's shifting. Let's talk about outdoor media for one second. How many people here do outdoor media? Just for context, raise your hand. You guys are a smart fucking bunch. All right. That being said, I do. If you live in New Jersey, you might have driven the turnpike and seen a huge billboard of me with a glass of wine. I like outdoor media. Makes you seem grand. But when I see companies spending money on outdoor media, I have a problem. And here's what it is. Do me a favor. If you remember one thing from this talk, when you're next home, the next time you're home, whether that's today or you fly back and you drive home, the next time you drive, Please look at the five people, at least five people driving next to you. While you're driving, just take a good hard look at five people. I'm gonna tell you right now, three of them are texting. Oprah's right, this shit is dangerous. Three of them. So let me just say it for the record, for all the people at home running businesses. People are not looking at billboards and outdoor media. They're not even looking at the fucking road. How many people here can't wait to run and get their direct mail? Who's up for that? Ooh, ooh, direct mail, who's pumped? I love it when I'm like in these meetings and people are like, we're still doing direct mail, we're a little bit more of a conservative company, Gary. I get it, do you look at direct mail? Fuck no, asshole. How many people here have a TiVo or DVR? Raise your hands. How many people here, TiVo or DVR, the majority of the shows they watch on television? How many people here, of those people, in 2011, have fast forwarded every single commercial for the year? Raise your hands. Hold them up. You know what, fuck it, stand up. Please do me a favor. Please, I know you're tired, but this would mean so much to me. Please stand up if you fast forwarded every single commercial in 2011. Look around, are you fucking kidding me? And prices are up 18% for commercials? People aren't watching them. Thank you guys so much, that meant a lot. And exercise is good, you know, a little blood flow. How many people watch television with at least one screen in front of them? 
laptop, phone, or iPad? Raise your hand. How many people watch television with two screens, phone and iPad? How many people in this room watch television with three? Phone, iPad, and laptop. Raise your hands. All right, the 60 of you are sick as shit. (laughs) Yet, yet, every piece of creative on television right now, commercial, does not extend the story, does not push the content online. You don't watch a commercial where it tells you to go to Facebook, hit the like button, and see the rest and claim your prize. Reebok Hockey did a good job. I don't know if anybody saw this, look it up. Sidney Crosby was playing his teammate, it was to five, they got to three and it says you wanna see how it finished? Go to Facebook, I click over and in 20 minutes, 20 minutes, they picked up 62,000 fans because people watch and they're sitting right there ready to be activated. The business world, my friends, in 2011 is acting like 2007 and that is where it is our opportunity. Now, what is the thank you economy? Why did I call it thank you? Because thank you means you're welcome and what can I do for you and how can I help you? This will probably be the most retweeted quote of my entire talk. I believe that most people in this room and in business think about content. How many of you in here have heard content is king? Raise your hand. Everybody talks about content. Content's so important. Your product itself, content. Commercials, the way you advertise, your landing pages, the UI, the UX, all that stuff. Content is massively important. If your product's not good, you lose. My wine show that made me famous on the internet, I had to know what I was talking about. The 15 years that I spent learning wine leading up to my first show is what made it work. However, the real secret sauce into why I have 900,000 followers and things of that nature is the word that is the single most important word to every single company in this room. Period, the word, the word for the next decade. Context. We are living in a context war right now. When I think about content, how good your product is, how creative your advertising is, how well you're converting your SEO or pay for click to conversion and landing pages and all that shit. When I think about that, I think about the quote that matters the most right now, which is when Eric Schmidt six months ago said, the amount of content that we are producing as human beings in this world right now from the beginning of mankind, like when we fought dinosaurs and shit, the beginning, until 2003, remember 2003? It was like six seconds ago. From the beginning, every radio, every piece of print, every TV show, every billboard, every song, I'm not just talking the US, Russia, China, global, every piece of content that we as human beings have created from the beginning of mankind until 2003, is now being replicated in volume every 48 hours. No wonder our kids are ADD. How is your content going to break through in a world where there's that much of it? We all know that everything is so fragmented. The water cooler about television now is impossible. There's 73,000 shows and video blogs and everything. We're living a more fragmented world. So do you have the audacity to think that your content is gonna break through? And this is where social comes in. Because we know about global and we sure know that companies like Google and other companies are battling on a local level, right? Google doesn't buy Zagat just for their name if they don't think local is really important over the next five years. However, it is my firm belief that the battle of marketing going forward, which means business, is going to be individual. I believe that we are in the dawn of one-on-one marketing. And in that one-on-one marketing world, the stakes are gonna be very high for all of us because something very ironic is happening. As we all go Jetsons, the action is in being like the Flintstones. It is my firm belief that every single person's grandparents are more prepared to be successful in the next decade than you guys. Because the way business was built in the old days was built on small town rules. And what the internet is doing, and oh by the way, let's talk about the internet. This isn't about social media. I don't give a rat's ass about Facebook or Twitter or Google Plus. These are tools. This is just the maturity of the internet itself. How many people here in this room do not remember the world, don't remember it, pre-internet? Just cannot, do not remember 1993. Raise your hand. Sir, you do not remember 1993? How old are you? 
How much? 36. It's only like 18 years. What, what did you drink too much in college? Hey, you were 18. I didn't mean figuratively. I mean the far majority, 99% of us, remember the world pre-internet. This has all happened very quickly. All the stuff that's relevant and that we talk about didn't even exist a decade ago. When I, when I hear people debate, what's the ROI of social media, right? Like, is it worth it? Like, what's the value? Like, I'm not converting. It just makes me remember why, I'm gonna play over here. It makes me remember why so many businesses fail. The problem is, most businesses are not playing the marathon. They're playing the sprint, right? They're not worried about lifetime value and retention. They're worried about short-term goals. Social is not going to excite anybody in this room for what it's going to do to your bottom line in a six month or 12 month period. It just can't happen. See, social media marketing is like going Beyonce on your customers. You've gotta put a fucking ring on it. (laughs) Meanwhile, 99% of the people in here, and I looked at some Twitter and Facebook accounts of some of the peeps in this room, 90% of you, more, but I'm trying to be nice, are treating social media like a one night stand. Most companies are failing in social because everybody in social is acting like a 19 year old dude. They're trying to close on the first transaction. It's going right? The stakes are so ridiculously high. The first talk I ever gave was about e-commerce in 1995, 1996. Guy came out with a PowerPoint and gave so much data on why people would never put their credit card into a computer, you would have left so convinced you just couldn't even conceive of launching a dot com. There's no way, it was a conservative audience, and then he was pretty gangster, I actually respected his bravado. He goes, and this kid's gonna come out next and tell you that you're gonna buy wine on the internet. And everybody's like, ha, 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 ha. So I come out, and my opening line is, first of all, I respect your gangster style, so thank you, but number two, the only thing I wish is that this was being recorded. Because in 10 to 15 years, Mr. PowerPoint, you're gonna be fucking wrong. So that was my opening line. By the way, he was, and we know that. What I am shocked at right now is that people that are building real businesses, who've seen this happen before, every debate of the ROI of social right now is the same conversation we had about e-commerce. People don't wanna bet on the culture shift because it's not happening in the next 20 minutes. It's hard. People don't want to do that. However, I promise you, the companies in this room that don't bet on it, don't go all in, because the big problem is, most people in this room are half pregnant. You're half in, you kinda wanna be in but then you don't see the quick results, and you hedge. You don't understand what's really happening, because for the first time ever, it's not push. For the first time ever, marketing isn't what I'm doing right now, giving a presentation and hoping it converts. For the first time ever, it's a cocktail party. Everybody's in play. Totally different skill set of giving a good presentation up here and then working the room like a cocktail party. Totally different. I dominate both, but some don't.